Okay, before our brain explodes. <coughs> I'm actually halfway through the slide. Okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> what I've done so far is to retrieve data, slice subset data. Now is to change the layout data. Okay. So you all will recall from your basic Python, you have this reshape function, right? So if I have a 3x3, three three, I can reshape it to 1x9. Okay. If I have a 4x5, I can reshape it to a 2x10. Okay. As long as the number of elements in your final array is the same as the previous. So that's the general rule for reshaping. Okay. So in pandas, you can also do some sort of reshaping. Um, but here, maybe it's more like manipulation. So here are some of the methods like dropping things. So dropping columns will be to exclude columns you don't need. Okay, especially when you get a very large data set with too many columns and you really need to focus on that few things, you should drop columns at the start and then continue working with data. Concatenation when you want to append rows. Useful if you get um, multiple sets, multiple files of the same data. Okay, that situation is very, very common, especially when you're in a place where um, there's a lot of information floating around. So to give you a one real life, life example, my wife is an analyst, analyst in the clinic. She has recently told me she needs to process 7,000 files. Then I'm like, what happened? Why do you need 7,000 files to deal with? Because basically every day in the system, it generates one file with the same number of columns. So because of that backlog, there's 7,000 over days of files to process. Okay, so if you're doing a data science job, you will, might encounter this kind of situation, you will need to concat rows, <laughs> obviously. Okay, um, you can also concat columns. So if you need to combine two different data that have a similar relation, maybe like year, you can do a concatenation. And of course, pivoting, you all know in Excel, pivoting, uh, melt, <laughs> nicely, nicely put across. So melt is a pandas function. Please take note of the PD and DF in front. Uh. So DF are data frame functions, PD are your pandas function. So melt basically combines two col uh, right, do the col columns into rows. Like, like unpivoting. Uh, okay. Sorting by value, sorting by index. Okay. So in Excel, you know that you can choose a column and sort by that right? column value, everything will move, right? So now you can finally do the same thing in data frame to say I want to sort by example in the earlier data like by the year or oh no not by year I want to sort by number of applications okay and the year and the application type will follow also so this is the sort values or sort by index sort by index will be useful if you have a index in your data source that is uh, maybe like student ID sorting it so my student ID is one example okay. Re-index, reset index, and rename. So I think we can go through each of them along the way. Okay, so drop columns. So I'm going to read another file, uh, which one is more interesting. Okay. Must choose one with a lot of columns. <clears throat> Not a lot of columns. I've seen in your CA1, you, some of you choose a data set with a lot, a lot of columns. Room type, area, space, floor, story. Which one is that? You just done the CA1, you forgot what you did. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So set. type area, floor, town. It's got a lot, a lot of columns on. Ah, this one. Someone use this right. Got a lot of columns one. Very nice. I see you, I see you really feel very happy. Like, oh, I can do a lot of things. Okay, I'm going to use this. Also very good for the next example because you drop some things and then manipulate and then combine stuff. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm gonna upload 
extract this <coughs> okay wow so for those who did this right you have five files which one you choose uh? <laughs> the latest one uh? 212 to 1240 okay 17 onwards okay this is very interesting it's interesting because HDB because they have changed systems and whichever right so over the years they have collected some information and maybe partial Oops. So let's take a look at the data here. So if you were doing CA1 and you happen to choose this data set to work on, okay? So this is interesting because um, it's under one title, resale flat prices based on approval date, and they have different years, okay? 1990 to 1999, and then followed by 2000 to 2012. Okay. <clears throat> So if you open each of them, anyone open all of them? Who did this? Sir? Anyone? Can I raise, it? raise hands? Are you the only one who did this? I think there's one more. Okay. okay. Actually, this is a very good example for concatenating uh, columns, uh, calling rows. So this is data 1990 to 1999. Um, obviously, more columns than this. Maybe all the same. So if all these five files have the same number, of, same number of columns, and the labels, the column labels are exactly the same, it's a good case to actually append the data together. You can process it as a whole. If you want to look at a bigger picture or a longer picture, from 1990 all the way to yeah, latest 2017 onwards. Okay. So if you didn't have the, if you didn't have to combine, you didn't want to combine it, you can just take a look at the snapshot like the last two years, 2017 to yeah, recent or recent, right? Okay. So maybe I will use this few files. Hey. Right, let me pick out from 1990. Okay, start with that. Okay, import pandas as PD. What is my source load? Okay. So my data frame, read CSV. Then oh, I should print it out. Okay, so in my file that I take out from 1990 to 1999, here are my columns, Mantown, whichever, right? Okay, so say I want to drop stuff, things I don't want to care about, or depend on what I want to do. So one of the maybe one of the information here that doesn't matter to me so much could be street name. You know, I don't care about street name if I want to like just talk about resale prices. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even like the block, the block number doesn't matter to me. Okay. As well as maybe the flat type. So like any typical uh, step when you deal with data, you want to have like a few a bit of an idea how it looks like, right? Like getting the columns put on the first five rows and see what it looks like to decide do you want or not some of the information 
Okay, so fat model improve. Maybe I don't care about the fat model. Just look at, I don't care about the street name and the block. Just pull out uh, maybe the fat type and the resale price. Okay, so I want to drop some data. So I would say, let's say I want my DF2 to be some sort of filtered out columns. Okay, so I want to draw a list. To draw a list of columns, I just need to pass in a list. Uh, in this case, sorry. block, I don't need it. Street name, I don't need it. Maybe the story range, not particular for my study. Okay, uh, flat model. Okay, and probably the floor area square meter. Of course, I just want to use the flat type. So, okay. Did I drop it correctly? Oh, I didn't drop it correctly. Exist, sorry. You all remember Axis from Python? Who remembers this, this parameter Axis? No. Okay. okay, Axis defines vertical or horizontal. Okay, uh, so you need to tell Python the Axis because your Axis refers to one refers to the horizontal here, which is the columns. Axis, the other value of axis refers to the row, uh, the row and the column. Sorry. So one would be row, the axis two would be column. So if you order to remove the columns in this field, this list of columns based on this name, you will need to tell handlers which axis to look for the columns. Okay. So if you want to remove the columns, then it'll be axis one. Okay, specify name of columns here. So my new DF two does not have all those uh, columns that I dropped off. So this is the result. Okay. So next function you can try out is called the concatenation. So concat will be to append rows to data frames. So you have two files with the same columns, you need to concat the rows together. Now I have the same problem here. So I have two files. My files. Okay, so just now I opened this resale, right? So I'm gonna pick up uh that's my year two thousand. Oh, don't have it. Missing. Yeah, two thousand. Yeah. So I want to concat the year two thousand batch files with the nineteen ninety to nine nine nine. Right. Okay. So let me read the file first. So here now for DF two thousand. So to concat basically or generally you uh you may have read like certain multiple files and you need to combine them together. Um this case I because I actually removed columns from my first CSV first uh, data frame, so I will probably need to do the same thing too. So I'll drop this, guys. Yeah, okay. And then I'll try to combine the two. So if let's say DF, so this DF four, okay. Maybe assemble. 
So I'll take pd.concat df2 and this one. Okay. Actually, I'm doing this a bit recklessly. I'm never going to check the columns. Oh, data frame. So sorry. Put them in a square bracket. Okay. So to concat them, make sure I put them as a as a array list. Uh, if that is next. Oh. Okay. Yes, Oh. Okay. Wait. Hold on. <clears throat> what happened? Oh, because I didn't really complete it. Okay, so let's do a describe. Okay. How do I know that I actually combine the two files, right? Try my luck. Okay. So I'll need to print the length of the first file. And then print the length of the second one. So first file has 28,000 records, uh, sorry, 287,000 records. Second file has 369,000 records. The combined length of them, 656,000. So if your columns are the same, you can just concat them and you get this thing. So if you, let's say you're doing your CA1 on this data set and you decided to do very, very gung ho and go and combine all the <coughs> five files together, then you will read one by one, do concat, 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 concat. Okay. Then very likely, I think you have like more than one million records to process. Okay. So that is your concat by rows. Uh, append columns. How? Oh, okay. Another appending columns is like adding another dimension to your data. Okay. So here is an example of two data sets that have some similar do they have some similar rows or oh, no they don't have it all okay so in the index here if you look at this example okay the data of the df1 has this weight agenda okay uh with names okay and df2 is another set of names so we combine these two things together by the uh, by using concat so first of all what it what pandas will do is, oh, you have weight, right? Uh, okay, does it have weight? Doesn't have weight. Or rather, I have height here, doesn't have height. So height will go in as another column. Okay, gender, it has gender, okay, cool. Then you try, you, you merge it together. Now the problem is the indexing is, diff is actually different. The index on the DF1 are based by the names which doesn't exist in DF2, correct? So what will happen is that you get the two data data frames that combine both have a lot of missing values. So whatever that that row doesn't have for the column, it will just replace it with any hand. I think you saw it earlier when I earlier example from the um, from changing the indexes. Okay. So same thing happened if you were to take two simply unrelated data and mesh it up together. Yeah, then you get like a list, a whole bunch of areas where there's no information at all. Like in this case, this case, all the NAM here. Hmm? Yeah, recording. Okay. Mm -hmm. So concatenation of two very different data structures may not be a very good idea. Okay, because of the missing gaps you create. 
So next will be your favorite uh, Excel function called pivot. <clears throat> so pivoting in the example is when you have a typical data frame, zero, zero index space, and you do a pivot. Um, you have to choose the column that becomes the index. Okay, so that's why when you pivot, you see there's a index parameter here. So by you need to tell the tell pandas that okay now I instead of the natural index is provided, I want observation to be the index. Okay, and the columns to be gender gender, and the values to be weight. So you get this kind of a switch over. So observation values 0 to 1 to 6 becomes the index here. Okay. As for weight, the values is weight is here. So then the values in gender become the so called the, the column. So whatever values you have, let's say for example the earlier version uh, my earlier data of the the uh, financing purchasing right the finance uh, example okay. okay so earlier on when I had read this file in the application receipt to finance it has three columns okay financial year number application I could actually pivot this thing to say okay now it might want my index to be application type okay then I can say or oh, rather my index to be financial year and I spread out the application type as values. So you could do something like that too. Right. Now the next one will be the gather or melt, uh, gather column rows called the melt function. So melt function you also need to specify what is the new index, uh, not really what is the new index, but what are the index uh, variables. So if your before pivot, this is a table, uh, you do a melt after pivot before melt. Okay, so normally you pivot first, right? Then now we're going to do a melt, which is actually pulling it back uh, generally into a similar table before you do a pivot. So one thing is that well your original columns in the pivot before you pivot can be retained. However, the so-called your variable here, notice the weight instead of weight instead of becoming a column becomes a row, followed by the value itself. So the ID variables here, okay, so ID typically normally says for the index. So what happens is that here your index variables is a combination of observation and gender. So from here I take the observation and the gender F and M. So 1F weight 45. Then 2m65 here. So it's doing that kind of matching between the row, the column here, and the row here, and the column value, or the column label. So you, if you, if we did a matching of column, row, column, row, column, right? Okay. So if you naturally be like 1f, 1m, 2f, 2m. Okay. So the question is, why is there no, why is that uh, no, don't have a one M appearing here also, right? Okay, so my logic is, if I'm gonna take every row here, the index here, and pair it with the column under gender, I should have a one F, one M, two F, two M, three F, three M, right? But here I don't have it. I don't have the other pair. So probably the reason is because your M here is not a number, it's not a valid value, so it skips it completely. Yeah. Counting number of female and male. If you mean before pivot or after you pivot and milk? <laughs> well, 
Oh, as your people, when your people, you will ask you to do, uh, like option like sum or average one of the columns, right? If it's a counting, lah. I not tried before, <laughs> but it's worth to explore. Because uh, if Excel normally Excel when you pivot, you also do some grouping or aggregation. So aggregation you may have some uh, formulas to sum, average, right, mean and max. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. Like, can do I don't think part of the melt function itself. Or generally pivot. Well, um, based on the documentation for pivot, the function does not support data aggregation. So it means you don't have a sum, count, average, those kind of functions you get in Excel. So if you want to pivot like Excel with your aggregation functions, you after you pivot, you will probably need to create another data frame and then concat it to this. Explanation in example. <laughs> okay, so if this is the original data and it's a pivot to observation as the index, right? Now my male female here. Okay. I want to count the number of female male. If that's your question, right? Okay. If I want to count the number of male and female, um, after doing this, I can I can do Okay, actually, you can, you can do it before even pivot. Now, because the aggregation step is no longer part of the pivoting process, right, you can choose to do the count before you pivot, actually. Unless it makes sense to mm -hmm. makes sense to include the function as part of a column or a row. So in Excel, the way you do it in Excel, I think they package your pivot together with a lot of functions because it's kind of a common requirement. If you pivot tables, in a table format, your bottom row would normally contain some kind of total or summation or average. Okay? Or your left right hand right hand side at most extreme would be some kind of summing of numbers in a horizontal manner. So in a visual format it, it makes sense. But in pandas, because you're not exactly representing in a visual format like that, they don't put aggregation as part of a pivoting as a pivoting function. So if you want to pull out extra numbers, you will likely do what you did in CA1 with your analysis. So pull out by the column, say this is the max, this is the count, this is the minimum. Yeah. Mm. Okay, another example of melting. Okay, melting. Melting, <clears throat> gathering columns in the rows. So if you're given a data where your, okay, the 0 to 5 is the metro index. So row base, year on year and the, the columns of the years okay and on the left are the different people so these are maybe like i'm guessing they're weight uh. <laughs> okay okay wait yeah yeah these weight years so you want to melt this you could actually say i only want i want a column of years and then the, the weight for the person now the problem here okay how does 45.5 48 and 50 become just this a single year. So Mary will appear three types because there are three years. Probably get that. Okay. Best if I use this data. Okay. So coming back to this example earlier on. Um I have financial year application type number of applications. So this format is, uh, is is possible after you melt it. Now, if I, I say possible after melt it, if let's say the data was given to you in a different way, if the column happened to be 2008, 2009, 2010, right? You will probably want to melt it in this fan manner where your financial year is a single column, then every financial year is a separate column by itself. Okay. Um, particularly, how when do you use a melt? 
Now, if you do obtain data uh, with the column labels being actually part of a timeline, right? so in this case, a good example would be year. year. Year becomes a column label. It makes sense to melt it because actually it's better to process the data when the year is in the column instead. Okay. Now, if your columns are all names uh, or categories, then then it could be possible, right? Let's say this is, is imagine if these column labels are like flat types, one room, two room, three room, four room. Okay. And you need to do something to compare uh, something with flat types. You might want to melt that into one column. Okay. Sorting is pretty straightforward. Uh, so sort values by weight. This is interesting. I should try to sort my data here. <clears throat> so I'm going to take my financing data, HD finance data, and do some sort on this guy. So, HDB sorted. So I'll sort by application, number of applications. So sort by values will be sort values. And what is the value that I'm going to sort by? It's by the column number of applications. Okay, so uh, sorry, print wrong one. Yep. So when you sort by applications, the row moves also. So here is the least and to the most. So I don't know why the after sort this this picture. I think wrong picture. Okay. This look like after you pivot and melt, then you do this sorting. Okay, uh so sorting doesn't change the structure, it still remains as it is. Okay, going on to the next one. Data frame by sorting data frame by index values. Okay. Uh, index values would be, of course, the natural index. If I take this data and sort it by the index value, it would be, it would be the same. Actually, it would be the same as the original. So, HDB sort by index. <clears throat> What's the function again? Sort index. Okay, sort index. So what? Ascending. Uh, true. And yep. You want to reverse it to descending indexing. Descending indexes. Just replace descending to false. You get this. So we're starting from the last index. <clears throat> Okay, um, so if you can also sort by index values together with another criteria. Okay, uh, set index and sort index. Okay, okay uh, setting index is interesting here. So Imagine, so this is the data of stock prices. So stock prices typically come in date, trading date or time. Now when you notice that the set index method here is applied uh, with, by trading date and price type, what happens is that these two columns become an index. Okay, so remember indexes are by nature meant to be unique. Unique means this combination of date plus the price type is a unique combination and with the close and high compared to the next row is also a unique combination so after it set the index to be a combination of columns and you say I want to sort index now by price type okay so what happened is that your price types the all the rows get moved by price type now so because price type is alphabetical, so anything that has to follow alphabetical order, so open happens first, followed by high and then close. Um, 
sorry, descending order here. Ascending is four. So O be before that. O be after the H, uh, before the C. Or O after the H, H after the C. Okay, the date. What about the dates? The dates has moved as well. So previously 2014, 02, 21. Now ends up below here. I should try this example here with data. I should try with the uh, the resale prices. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is look, use my previous data I have read in, which is the resale fat prices based on approval date. So now I have a DS sample, which is a combined 1990, 1990 to 2012. Okay, so I'm going to do a re index. Uh, setting index, something like this, um, and then sorting an index. So what I have here is the month. Okay, so I need to choose which one I want to play around with. Maybe I'll use the month and year month and town number. Okay, I'll try a month and in type can also. Maybe it's not a good example. Then. Okay, so okay, never mind. Let me skip this one. Hmm. <clears throat> Indexing data So next item here is re indexing data frames.
Actually, right, I'm thinking of just keeping this part. <laughs> hmm? Oh. Twenty six is yeah, so the week uh yeah. Thirty first uh thirty first. Follow the link deadline. Thirty first, right? Cause twenty seven is a holiday, right? Yeah. Wow. So should I do the online on twenty nine? Since twenty first, twenty seven is a. Hmm. Yes, you will have online on the 20th, right? Yeah. Oh, 20th, 20th, 20th. Yes, so 27th is, is uh, you'll be public holiday, right? Chinese. Yeah. So we can move into 29th. Uh. Yeah. 29th is a Wednesday. Yeah, or a or a call so. Uh, huh? Lab four. Oh, you only go through lab four. Yeah. No, because uh, I I I I take a look at CA two. They just give you very big, but they never tell you anything. CA two, they have no sample, right? Okay, la. okay. So I stop at the sorting. I mean the indexing, la. Okay, the indexing of data frame. I stop it here. Okay. Right. I have no idea. I have no inspiration to talk about indexing of indexing anyway. Okay, the data for here is normally not. Uh, okay, I don't do it much. Okay, your CA two right. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Three data sets. Uh, unrestricted. So previously, CA one you uh, restricted to HDB, right? So right now you have more choices to choose a data set from. Like the links I send you, you can choose anywhere from anywhere as long as you have a link to specify the assignment. Just put that. But you must have three data set. Okay. You must also have a feature which will be covered in the last lecture. Retrieve the data set in a relational store and retrieve in a relational database. Okay, who here knows what the relational database is? Okay, except for the visitor here. <laughs> you know, you know a lot. Uh, so you can say. Okay, uh, last topic when you look at the calendar. The final topic, topic five, right? SQL. Okay, SQL main SQL basically stands for sequential query language. The standard language that we use to query databases, query and manipulate data in the database. So a database will be as layman as possible. Okay, imagine your own whole, whole of Excel spreadsheet stored in a system, a file, a sort of a file system, where there can be many users who tap on it at the same time. 
Okay, if you ever share your Excel file in a network drive in Windows or your, your Active Directory, right, you know the pain when you open the file and your clearly open the file at the same time. And then you're both safe at the same time, what happened? <laughs> Complete, right? Okay. So database allows multi concurrent usage of data. Now, so there's a way that it's been stored, but there's also a way of retrieving it. So the standardized way of retrieving it, we call it SQL. So it's like typing commands to say, give me information from this worksheet or a table, you know, based on this criteria. Or I want to insert some table in, data in, insert some rules in, delete or update some things. So there are certain sort of commands associated with accessing a relational database, which is tied to SQL. Now in your assignment, it also says, or a no SQL database like MongoDB. Okay, so what is MongoDB and NoSQL? NoSQL is a little bit like the reverse of SQL. So there is still a space where data is stored and many users can, can access it. But you don't use the SQL language per se to access it. You use something like functions based on what the database type is. In this case is like Mongo. Mongo has a way of accessing the data based on the so-called APR library. So imagine it's like another pandas with function to say this is how you get data, this is how you insert data, this is how you change, modify information on it. Okay. So in order to use MongoDB, you will need to go and read up how to do certain things in MongoDB. Okay. Equivalent effort. Uh. So for your case, how to access, how to use SQL to access a certain relational database. Types of relational database you can download and install on your computer are the open source or community types like MySQL. It's the most common open source database, relation database you, you, people usually download and use. Okay? So Must cover this topic too, this topic. Okay, but the good news is this. Your program must include features to allow users to store and retrieve. So you must know how to store and retrieve from either of these two database systems. Okay, so in your whole pipeline of work, okay, the beginning is where you retrieve. Then you do your processing, plot your charts, and somewhere along the way you extract the data, you transpose it, and then somewhere there you say store it in. So this topic five will help you deal with the first part of retrieving and the last final bit of storing it there. The middle part of the work is still your visualization, your extraction, your transposition of the data, okay, let's say, which is using NumPy, Pandas, and MapCombin. That is the part of your work. Retrieving and storing is just like the uh, getting through the door and getting out of the door. Lah. <laughs> okay. So, yes, you may now use other data visualization <laughs> as is mentioned here, like Seaborn, Bokeh, Pygal. No. <laughs> Okay, so like some of you have actually Googled how to solve your problem CA1. I saw somebody use Seaborn uh, somewhere. Mm. Okay, so if you have Googled solutions, you may try to Google how to use Seaborn or Bokeh, but in I think in any case, before you use it, we need to understand what does it do <coughs> anyway. Uh, okay, if Matplotlib library is good enough to give you the charts, which is four out of these six charts options, then stick with the library. Stick with something you're familiar with. I mean, in CA1, you did, I see a lot of bar, bar chart. I seen one pie chart. All of you, only one person do pie chart. I seen a lot of line chart, some histogram, a lot of scatter plot from the same data. You know, discuss among yourself, right? No. no. <laughs> okay, never mind. All the scatter plot look the same. La. <laughs> oh, okay. Most of, I think, three of the scatter plot all look the same, except for one of them. Uh, or several, not two, maybe two of them, okay? And box plot, because box plot was in the sample, so probably easier to copy with that. I mean, easier to take inspiration, mm -hmm. sorry, not copy, inspiration. Okay, so um, these four charts can be done in matplotlib. You don't need to use Seaborn Bokeh unless you already play with these tools already. So you know, you must ask, because in the moment that you're right, what is your, <laughs> Where? What? A student? 
Wow. Yeah, this is just a fancy box spot. Lah. Seriously. <laughs> so you're not doing all map plot. Yes, I'm fine with all map plot. I'm gonna, gonna say because you never use anything fancy, right? You're gonna be penalized. Okay, if you want to be earning extra points, score extra bonus points, right? There is a section here that tells you where your extra points come from okay. or lesson notes. So far, none of us fail, right? Okay, good. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. All of you, Jen, uh, the distribution is relatively normal. Okay. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> oh yeah, I must ask like the cost, the cost natural whether can really score or not. Ah, okay, um, for those who are wondering where to get bonus points from, right? Okay, bonus points, uh, I, I, did, I, I did say this before. Interactive visualization. If your visualization, sorry, visualization is interactive, you will get bonus points. You got, got teach, and you got your show in the slide. Um, <laughs> you tell me, uh, one of you try to do, yeah, one of you try to do the interactive map plot lib, right? But it didn't work. Okay, number one, if you do an interactive map plot lib in Jupyter Notebook, it will not work because Jupyter Notebook only renders out a static JPEG image, non-interactive. You want an interactive version, you have to run off the Python command shell. Then that one come up with interactive. Who wants to do interactive? That will cover in the online one. Yes, in trying to get a sum up. Yes, seriously. It says here, don't know compulsory bonus must be given to students who are able to produce interactive visualizations. Okay, I will okay, I will try I will expose you to the Python one for interactive visualizations. <laughs> Come on, from. Can I find the data or CSV files, right? Okay, wait. Okay, when you run the Python off the command shell, which is where your .py file yeah. is stored, if your your data file is together in relative, relative together in the same folder, it should work. Same, same place, same location as your Python file. So the name of the file should just be the name. Of the name. It should just be the name. Okay, so. The Something like okay, your data set. If your data set is in another location, then one way is to use the absolute path. Absolute path means literally C drive this folder, this folder, this folder, all the way until the file. Okay, assuming your Python file, the PR file is somewhere else. Uh, okay, which is not a really good way to do it. A better way of doing it or convenient is to put a PR file, PY file, Python file together with your data file in the same folder. In that way, when you call, in that way, when you call your file, you just, you just need to call the name of the file. You don't need to have any folders in front. Of <coughs> oh, sick! Very big text. <coughs> um, so, if, let's say. Sorry, <clears throat> Come on, come on. <laughs> okay, for example, okay, this is my directory in command prompt. You okay, see the active cases for home office scheme CSV is right in this folder. Now, you're going to run your Python file that will read this state and generate a chart in Python. You could conveniently put your Python file here in the same place where your, data, your CSV file is. Okay. Then you can just pie it, right? 
Um, so, so that's one way. Yeah. And how much more points? Are? Okay. Everything must quantify, right? <laughs> Hmm? Kai Chama. Can. You're not limited to just Jupyter notebooks. You can just you can give me give me a dot py file. It's fine. I can can just run it. Of course, it must be packaged together with data in the same format. Uh, okay. How many points, right? No. Uh. So the question is, the question is, the question is that if you satisfy the components, right? Like, oh, you have done component A, fifty percent all done, right? Yeah. Yeah, you did three. You have done the data that store and retrieve. You have done all these things, right? Fifty is given. Okay. Quality is the one that is, huh? Okay. So because quality here also includes aesthetics and creativity. Now that is subjective. So aesthetics and creativity will include interactivity. So I will not give full 30 if it's just a picture. So there's a matter of, I will not say how many percent that will have to give you interact that will attribute from interactivity. Do you say 3%? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Did you say or are you I didn't say, 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 say 3%. Okay. Um, data analysis is actually also subjective. Okay. Five, the 5 cell reflection is given. Uh. Yeah. This reflection, if you complete that one, is 5 is given to you. Um, on the analysis, quality analysis and presentation and completeness, okay. I noticed in CA1, a lot of, uh, some of you try to draw a story, okay, I, which I think that is the best way to do it. Whatever data set you have, you try to draw a single story around it, rather than um, three data set, what, three um, charts, and then four chart, each chart one analysis, okay, and that is jointed. So ideally, you should have a single plot, la, story plot around what you're trying to look at, okay. So if you were get, you will take data, let's say related to housing, uh, then your then there should be should be a single plot to say, oh, this means that we need more houses in Singapore, or this means that we are building too many houses in Singapore, okay? Or government doing the job, okay? Something like that. So if you try to get different data sets, if you do, like they must have some have some kind of relation to each other. Like if you were to take World Bank data, okay? And then you happen to have resale prices, uh, property prices in general in Singapore. And then you notice that there's a common common trend because there was an economic recession. And the World Bank data somehow gives evidence of that. Then you can draw a plot between these two things. So please try to draw a single story. Don't reach hard one analysis. So that will help improve your points for the completeness in the analysis of data. I know most of you, all of you passed up. So, uh, okay, CA2 is yada yada yada. Okay, so some of you have a question. We we'll have a question, right? If my does my three data set need to be in a database before I start? No. Your Python program must include features to allow to store and retrieve data sets. Okay, so at least one of the data set, three out of three data set, one of them needs to be stored in a relational database like MySQL or in a NoSQL database like Mongo. One out of three. The rest can be off a CSV file, right to a CSV file. Can we 
is the, the, the chart, right? So, us, these four charts we have uh, with the three data sets. This is the solar with the one, one vital data set. And now, so, so one of the data sets is like this, plus the chart that has one of the Okay, so this point number three, right? Point number three states that you have to use pandas in one at least one data set. So if let's say you're so comfortable with NumPy, right, and so good at NumPy, and you're finding difficulty with pandas, but you have to at least try to use pandas on one of the data set, and the rest you can just use NumPy if that's like your favorite and for most familiar way of doing it, or fastest way. Though. That's the interpretation. Can you use pandas on can. So it's like if you go and see page number nine, right? If you do one example one. Mm. So that so we are expected to do something with that for that page number nine. So I mean so 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 I want I was on so are we expected to do this as one of the compulsory? Because it's like go jump here and there's a that I know because you some of you did the text based analysis first, right? CA1. Yeah. So you give me the highest yeah. minimum max average standard deviation one. Okay, the, the describe like, almost yeah. actually. Uh, <clears throat> that is not a chart. Okay. So the this is additional is add on. Uh. Text-based analysis plus four chart. Then out of the four chart, one of it must have an SQL, correct? Um. Okay. Actually, right. If those who have done the text-based analysis in your CA one, if you didn't do it right, it didn't make it, it didn't make a difference at all. <gasps> Why? Then then this one must must go on the board. The text-based analysis. The question is throw back. Should be throw back at you. At what do you need from data? For example, let's say you in your report in an analysis, right? In your analysis, you want to cover the highest and the minimum. Then you need something from text-based analysis to give you the value. But to do the full text-based analysis, like what you have here, I know some of you actually did it uh, for CA one. Is that you give me? So your data analysis can be something you highlight in the chart. For example, your chart has a peak. So you did a peak highest and a the, the minimum, right? And you draw a circle there. And, and the only way to get the peak and minimum was to use the min max function, which was normally in the text analysis part. You, that's how you do it, right? So you can use, you once you use the function, you call out the, the points and you raise out, you know, and you actually highlight your analysis. It's good enough. I don't see, actually, you don't need the text based analysis. The reason why you do, why you have the text based analysis like this, okay? It's more of your it's more internally for you to understand the shape of the information or what kind of information you're you're looking at. So in short, you only need to do this is okay, right? Yeah, like this this whole thing. Actually, so you should ask yourself a question, what is useful for you in this text based analysis? What is useful for you or the reader? The reader will not be bothered with the shape of the data set. Whoever's reading your your chart, he won't care about the shape of the data set, he won't care about the range, the index or the data type inside. In fact, the only thing he might care, the person who reads your analysis will care about is this last section. Normally, they'll look at three, a few things. What's the mean, the standard deviation, mean and max? You may not even look at 25, 20, 50, 75 percentile, because that doesn't matter. So the question is, what does the, what is the reader interested to know? If, you actually, if it's not what is scoped to say clearly what the reader wants to know, then you decide. So if you're going to show a histogram, the distribution, and say that most of the things in the data fall within the first deviation, okay, then you need to show the mean, the standard deviation, and the, okay, that's it. You don't need to show the rest, which means your text-based analysis that you did before, like, this is very verbose, uh, which is like just, I don't care, just show you the standard five values, right? Okay, may not be useful. So if you take into account your analysis, then you do it. If you don't, then you don't need to show it, but. Got it? So I'm kind of surprised that you all deal a lot of the text-based analysis in CA1. Because you all saw the sample doing it, you just do it, right? Yeah, so 
So let's see this again. So you ask yourself, the first part, does it make sense or not? You put in, the, you put in the any presentation like that and it says, it will not make sense to anybody. It will make sense to you when you're doing it. Because you need to understand the data before you arrive at the final numbers. <coughs> you use the if you use my HDB data, I mean, uh, I mean, the same of the other, whatever, got loophole here. <laughs> <laughs> they never say you cannot use C. What you did is C A one. That means if you take your C A one, convert all your NumPy to pandas, and then submit to me, right, with the same chart, ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Because here never say you cannot reuse what you do here one. Got loop hole, huh? Okay. Seriously, never say. <laughs> <coughs> Technically, you can do that. Cool. So technically, you can take your CA1 work, change all your NumPy to pandas. Make sure you have one data set that retrieve and store into a database, relational or no SQL. And then submit it. <laughs> I'm the same person mark like, I'll be like, hey. <laughs> then your analysis don't need to do, do work, because same thing, right? <laughs> wow. That must ask you to question your ill integrity already, man. <laughs> ask yourself the question, do you feel professional doing that? <laughs> wow. Then you ask me, can I, can, is professionalism, professionalism something I can eat? Okay, technically you can, but please do something better. Try. I think you can also do something, I mean you can also do something extra. Lah. Okay, so the output need not be just the static images that you get. If some of you have some experience in web development, you can try PyGal. In fact, you're not limited to this also. Um, if you know any nice dashboarding tools, okay, you can also include that as your interactive example. Try lah. <laughs> I have my other tricks on my can <laughs> choose that. Uh, for me, I use Google Data, the Google Data Studio. So Google Data Studio is, is, is cloud-based and online now. So you can pump data in, I can create dashboard, and still look and visualize and inter interact with it. So that's that's a different thing. Okay. Um, so I think that's it for today. So online on Monday, I'll cover the lab items. Then next week, we'll finish up the rest of Pandas. Yeah, sorry about the indexing one. The indexing one to me is isn't really um, very so far very useful yet. Okay, Ken.